James Bond was right, and he already did the test long time ago. There is a difference between shaking and stirring. I would like to treat water the same way I treat a beautiful woman. The Egyptians had no idea what radioactivity was either. That's our state of knowledge. Perhaps in 10 years we'll understand what it's all about. This statement that water has a memory, of course that practically changes our whole way of looking at the world. Water is a bearer of secrets. It's full of mystery. It is always helpful when it comes to creating and preserving organic life. It stubbornly resists when we try to make it obey the established laws of physics, and then it lets the secret out, but poses a hundred new mysteries. To physicists, water is abnormal. While other materials contract as they cool, water expands when it freezes, making it lighter so that it floats on the surface of liquid water. If it sank to the bottom instead, life could not exist down there. The oceans would be one giant iceberg. 4.5 billion years ago, the conditions on the surface on Earth were very, very hostile. We don't know how it happened, however, we do know that it happened in what is called the primordial soup. This was a soup, in quotation, that was made from water and a mixture of many different molecules. The first organism that appeared were the bacteria. Nobody knows, and this is one of the greatest mysteries of science, how life evolved from the inanimate matter. The response to this unanswered question is most likely to be found in water. That's where we must begin our search for the origin of the first living creature. Can the water of today tell us something about the beginning of life? How the first organisms emerged from the sea remains another mystery. The Institute for Statics and Dynamics of Aerospace Structures at Stuttgart University. Professor Bernd Kreplin is a recognized and successful scientist in the aerospace field. Together with his colleague, Regina Henschel, he's been exploring the question, can water pick up and store information? This investigation could shake the foundations of traditional physics. The statement that water has a memory practically changes our whole way of looking at the world, of course. Let's travel down the Rhine in the figurative sense. The water is flowing down the Rhine, picking up information everywhere it goes. So the water has more information at the mouth of the Rhine than it had at the source. And the Dutch, living at the mouth, when they drink that water, they're also drinking all that information. Thus the world's oceans would no longer be something that separates us, but instead a giant storehouse of information, and the rain would perhaps be a data medium carrying information to the world. A great notion. But what kind of information is this? Can we make it visible? Or even measure it? In order for experimental results to be considered valid, they have to be repeatable. 
But how can we look inside a drop of water? The Aerospace Institute in Stuttgart has discovered a relatively simple way of making the structure of a drop of water visible. The drops are placed on a sheet of glass and allowed to dry. Under the microscope, they reveal fascinating images that can be photographed with a special camera. The researchers have had their efforts rewarded by insights into a very beautiful world. Each drop has a face of its own, unmistakable and unique. Why are the individual drops so different from one another? What do the photographs tell us? Who can interpret them? What information is stored in them and where did it come from? perhaps from humankind itself? Here we have person A who does something, and person B who does something, and person C who does something. They've all placed drops on a slide. They were from the same water, and now they've all dried. And each of these three drops looks different. We didn't change anything ourselves, and yet we get three different images. Thus, the differences must come from the three persons. And that, of course, made us want to find out how it could be possible, or better yet, whether it could be possible. So we got a lot of people to come to a lecture hall here at the Institute, gave them all the same water, had them make drops at exactly the same time, collected all the drops and then discovered that each individual produced different images from the same water. And here you can see the results. Here on the right you can see that the images of the individual students are different, but those made by a given student are all quite similar. This is the work of the first experimenter, this one here from the second, this from the third, and this from the fourth. Individually they can quite easily be reproduced, but you would never have thought that they were all from the same water, because when you compare the images from the different people you see some big differences. So it must be the case that information from the experimenter, who was holding the syringe in his hand but never touched the water, must have been transferred to the water and was captured in this image. Researchers around the world have been persistently trying to get water to reveal its secrets. Often it takes an accident to lead to a surprising result. Those who thought they knew everything about water have had to admit how little they really knew about this element. A sensational report arrived from America. Water was not originally the subject of research by the American TV technician John Cancius from Pennsylvania. He was looking for a way to fight cancer cells in the human body. One night, he had the idea of injecting gold nanoparticles and then exposing them to radio frequencies. The radio waves are said to heat the diseased cells and kill them without harming the healthy ones. By chance, he also discovered that radio frequencies can split salt water into oxygen and hydrogen, thus providing a source of fuel. The interesting thing is that's probably around 1500 degrees centigrade. This is uh, the most abundant uh, element uh, in the world, water. And salt water is everywhere. Uh, and to see it burn uh, actually gives me chills. No one has yet explained this phenomenon, but it is clear that the strong flame it produces can, for example, power a Stirling engine. The renowned physicist Rustam Roy had this to say about the discovery. It is the biggest discovery in water research in 100 years. That's in, John Buckley. In 100 Bucket. years? in water research. In fact, there is no guarantee that every discovery will contribute to human progress. Not without reason does it make an inventor shudder to realize that radio waves can make seawater burn. The idea that the black gold of oil might be replaced by the white gold of water to power the Earth's tens of millions of cars has something frightful about it as well.
The blessing and curse of an invention often lie side by side. On the one hand, it is fascinating that seawater might one day provide the solution to one of humankind's biggest existential problems, that of energy. On the other hand, we must realize that mass combustion of salt water might also have dramatic effects on the ecological balance of our planet. Research continues, of course, even when no immediate benefit is expected. At the University of Technology in Graz, Austria, young scientists are seeking to discover why water placed in two glasses and subjected to a high voltage charge will climb the sides of the glasses to meet. It doesn't do it at some random part of the glasses, but at exactly the spot where the water from the two glasses will meet. If one moves the glasses away from each other, the water creates a hanging bridge that can be up to two centimeters long. So far, even the world's greatest scientists have been unable to explain the phenomenon. So far, there is not even a theory about the sensational behavior of the water. An exact microscopic theory and an exact understanding of what is happening here, we haven't found that yet. And that is the reason that we're continuing to work on it. It's what makes this all so interesting. We would expect electrolysis, but under no circumstances would we expect a stable bridge that acts the way we see it acting here. That's what makes this all so fascinating. A half hour later, the bridge fatigues and collapses. Through the use of a red and a blue color filter, the movement of the bridge becomes more visible. It is the apparent flickering that amazes the scientists. From a physical point of view, it should not be taking place in this form because water cannot be compressed. Here we're using the same kind of measuring technique that we use in mechanical engineering, any time that we're dealing with very high speeds in a machine, whether it's rotational speed or flow velocity. It requires a special measurement technology, which we're using here on the water bridge. One can see that blue is trying to get to the red side, and red to the blue side. The next step in examining the phenomenon more closely is the use of a thermal imaging camera. With its help, we can see more clearly the mysterious processes taking place within the bridge. It is not difficult to see that all hells let loose here. The problem with such measurements is always that every measurement poses new questions instead of providing new answers. That means that we are constantly observing dynamic effects. And they raise questions that we cannot answer. So we have to consider new measurement processes that would allow us to find out, for example, where the structures that we observe in this water bridge come from. For the layman, it looks as though water could breathe. But for the scientist, it continues to be an unexplained phenomenon for now. Since we're using pure water and have verified that that's the case, we can't be seeing foreign bodies here. There can't be gas bubbles either. It's water in any case, but it is different water. Water that has a different structure at a different density. Despite all the problems that water poses to science, one thing is certain, its beauty is a great pleasure to behold. Scientists in Israel are also experimenting with water's ability to retain information. Here the measuring instruments are bacteria. If you expose water to electromagnetic, weak electromagnetic radiation, the effect should be erased within milliseconds. Not only that, but even if there is some effect, it should be so weak that even our best and most advanced uh, tools of technological tools 
will not be able to detect the differences. But the bacteria can do it. Not only they can detect the differences, but what they can do, they can amplify it to the point that we can look at the colony, that it's going after the bacteria were exposed to water that had some weak electromagnetic radiation, that they can go two or three times faster than the other bacteria. Researchers at the School of Physics and Astronomy at Tel Aviv University are exploring the question of whether water can tell when it is subjected to weak electromagnetic radiation. Use the bacteria as our detector to tell us or to show that really some changes have been occurring in the water and these changes actually we expose the bacteria after some time, an hour, two hours we can, that the bacteria these changes that were induced could survive for a long time. The experiments have led to interesting results. We have preliminary results, they are not published yet, and it seems, it's preliminary results, it seems that there are many genes that are related to metabolism, related to uh, a development of the bacteria that are upregulated. So they really sense something in the water. The internal structure of water molecules remains a mystery. Science attempts to penetrate the interior of the molecules to study them and to get a systematic picture of them. But even the most modern computers have their limits. We really don't know exactly everything what happened there, but uh, I can tell you for sure that if a molecule entered to water, so a lot of things changed. First of all, the molecule. It's the second, around the molecule you have a shell that we call it solvation shell of water molecule that surround this molecule and making the molecule different from the molecule outside water. So molecules can behave differently in water. And it's very interesting. Now, this molecule that you enter to the water will change all the molecule around that was before in the water. So it's a lot of complicated things. If water will be in a magnetic field, so the, they will behave differently. Sometimes totally differently. Because in magne magnetic field, all the paramagnetic species, paramagnetic species, it means the species that can change their behavior according to magnetic field, that are in the water will behave differently and they will change the chemistry in water. So it's very interesting to understand that water can change according to their area, to the area that surround them. We got like a 13 different types of water and each one of them was uh, analyzed with the LCMS technique and uh, we could see great picture because the different types of water gives us a different, really different picture of the, um, the inside of the water, the, the compounds that were inside. Many organic compounds um, mainly, but uh, it's the first time we got a picture where we could say, we could see with our eyes that Different sources are giving us different types of water, different uh, um, ion, ion uh, matrices inside the water. There is much to be discovered about water in the great outdoors as well. But to do that, one has to have the gift of seeing rivers and streams as partners. An Austrian river engineer has found a unique way of doing this. When you listen closely to a river or brook or stream, you immediately recognize its character. It's quite simple. If the stream is loud, I know I'm dealing with an energetic stream. If it's quiet, I'm dealing with a more gentle body of water. And thus, there is a very important distinction that I can make. I want my intervention in nature to be as small as possible. That means, I go to the water, 
And as a river engineer, I invite you to stay with me and do something for me, instead of the other way around, where I do something with the water. The normal concept for regulating streams consists of forcing them into a corset of concrete. But when the water is high, that method often does not work. But if one gives the stream a chance to move in the shape of a spiral, it will remain on its normal course. We've used river engineering methods to show that the current thread can be directed from the outside to the inside, and even into the stream bed. That means that the energy flows into the stream bed, flowing downward without causing damage. This has a highly positive effect, especially when the water is high, because the banks are not affected by the stream thread. Thus the water flows downward without damaging either bank. Success has proved Ottmar Grober right. He's drawing on the findings of the legendary natural scientist and forester Victor Schauberger, who in the period between the wars pointed out that one must study watercourses in order to deal with the problems caused by severe flooding. If we river engineers can successfully find a way of keeping the water in the landscape, we can save ourselves a lot of trouble and a lot of money as well. And at the same time, we can return to a kind of landscape that gives us back the thing we can and must call our highest good, our health. To what extent is water capable of picking up information? What does it perceive? And how does it remember it over time? We have done tests to see if the water is capable. Then we undertook experiments to find out whether things changed when we put something into the water. You can do that, for example, with stones or with metal, or even with living things such as twigs or flowers. Here you see a petal from a flower, a real flower. It was placed in the water. A while later we took a drop of water and we put it on a slide and took a photograph of it after it had dried. And here you can see one of the pictures. And you can see it in this picture. It's the typical image you get when you put a flower into water. You could recognize the flower in every single drop in this glass, of course. That can be reproduced and has significance. And if you were to put a different flower in here, for example, a sweet William flower, then all the drops of this water would look like sweet William. The Israeli scientist Eshel Ben Jacob uses completely different methods to arrive at the same conclusion. The odor of these plants that we have here can have a very, very strong effect. Not only if I put some leaf into the water, but just the odor which is deposited around has a very, very strong effect on the water. Uh, and this strong effect causes all the time inside to gather from the atmosphere, to be mixed in, to form a big network, very complicated network of bubbles, very, very tiny bubbles of gases. And the number of nanobubbles inside here, just to give you an estimate, it's about, uh, depends on the condition, it's about a thousand times the number of neurons that we have in our brain. Science and play instinct are often closely connected. As a scientist, you have to ask yourself, of course, whether there isn't a logical extension of this. What about plants? And so we tried an experiment that we'd like to call lettuce listening to a mobile phone. Here's what we do. We take so-called reference water, that is, water from the institute here, tap water, 
And you can see that here in the middle, it has a dark spot that you can see in the image. Well, it has that in every drop. So now we take the water, which we have in a big pot, and we simply throw in the lettuce, a real head of lettuce. And then we take pictures of it and we can see, aha, that's lettuce. Now the water knows, and you can see it, that there is a head of lettuce in there. Interestingly enough, the dark center has disappeared. This is something we very often see when we put something living into the water. It produces a bright center. The living thing apparently has a way of forming a center. So now we take a second head of lettuce and we let the second head listen to the mobile phone. That means we simply turn on the phone and hold it next to the lettuce for two minutes. And we assume that the lettuce has absorbed radiation from the phone. Now we take this head of lettuce and put it into the reference water as well, and we compare the two results. And you can clearly see from the results that the edge is completely different. The middle is somewhat different, so you can see that the lettuce was radiated by the phone and picked up the radiation. It has imparted that information to the reference water, and if we now take pictures of drops from the reference water where we put the lettuce, we can see from the water that this head of lettuce heard the mobile phone. That's apparently the way nature works. So funktioniert anscheinend die Natur. Water has a memory. And water has a kind of intelligence, much more than air, you know. Water is... it's a cosmic thing. Johann Grande, the waterman of Tyrol, believes that it is possible to transfer information from one sample of water to another, without the two of them coming into contact with each other. The process developed by him, so-called water revitalization, is based on the principle of conducting flowing water through a stainless steel container that is filled with revitalized water. The flowing water picks up the information from the still water. But Grande's success has its opponents, who call water revitalization parascientific nonsense. In fact, the process cannot be understood by using conventional scientific means. Nevertheless, more than 300,000 users worldwide rely on his system, from simple households to high-tech industries. Industrial users are not bothered by the critics. They rely on their own experience and results. Conventional water is aggressive and practically eats the pipes from the inside out, which leads to pipes bursting. At the Leedsen Mechanical Engineering Plant in Austria, there seemed to be no solution to the problem. We had very serious problems with corrosion, and that was reflected in many instances of broken pipes. We now have the situation better under control. At first I really couldn't get my mind around it, you know, because when you look at the container you really can't imagine what good it could do. But based on the fact that we now have fewer instances of broken pipes and all, I'm convinced that it really does help. Yeah. We monitored the water, and before we installed Grander, the iron content in the heating water was 26 milligrams per liter. Two months later, the iron had come down to only 0.7 milligrams per liter, which was, of course, excellent for the corrosion. The corrosion stopped. Does water revitalization make the water less aggressive? Positive results have been seen not only in the case of rust, but also with the accumulation of sludge. No one is sure why, but they are certainly pleased with the results. And in particular, we can say that the situation with sludge has noticeably improved. We also have records and measurements to prove it. They know the results, but not the reason. But isn't that good enough? FarmTech is a German company near Karlsruhe that produces plastic parts of all kinds. To maintain high material quality, the plant needs a good cooling system. 
We used to fill our cooling system with untreated tap water. Often, within only a couple of months, we'd find that the water had gradually gone bad. We then had to play around with various combinations of chemicals in an attempt to get the water under control. But we had little luck. We found a huge amount of rust in the system. Our lab tests also indicated the presence of a lot of bacteria and algae. All the problems pretty much disappeared when we switched over to the grander system. We just don't have to deal with these issues anymore. Water is a crucial factor in our production process. We needed process stability and now we have it. We're not much interested in taking water samples because we're not physicists or chemists. We prefer to stick to what we know best. If you had asked me last year whether such a simple change could have allowed us to use water without chemical treatment, I would have said, no way, not a chance. Often water has flowed a long way from the mountain to the valley. There is an old proverb that says, water is not clean until it has flowed over a stone seven times. There has been practically no research into the question of the importance to water of motion. What does the water pick up along its way from the air and from its surroundings? Does it bring information with it from inside the earth? Has it absorbed oscillations from minerals and ores? If so, can human beings retrieve it at the mouth of the stream? In an extensive experiment with asthmatic children, researchers at the Paracelsus Private University in Salzburg wanted to find out whether the waterfall at Krimmel had healing properties. 54 children were tested at a fun-filled summer camp. A group of children spent a fun-filled holiday at Krimmel, but far from the thundering waterfall. They were in high spirits. At the end of the three weeks, their lungs were tested. The overriding goal was to see whether this climatotherapy worked well on the children, whether they could take a positive long-term effect home with them, so that they could remain on their feet, especially in winter, when their lungs are likely to pick up an infection. The second group of children spent one hour a day at the waterfall, where the young asthma patients inhaled the spray. The microclimate of a waterfall has a high concentration of ions in the air. The humidity is almost 100%. This is the other group of children, the group that played for an hour a day at the waterfall and was exposed to the waterfall. Their lung function was also tested parallel to the other group. Playing near the impact zone, the children inhaled the humidity in the form of respirable water droplets. We don't know how the whole thing works, but we want to find out within the framework of this study at Paracelsus University. Most likely negative ions are not responsible for the effect, because we have already conducted an animal experiment in which we administered a similarly high concentration of negative ions to asthmatic mice. In that experiment, we were able to rule out any influence from the ions as an isolated parameter. Water vapor as well, as an isolated parameter, had no influence on lung function in animal experiments. At a dramatic rate, asthma is becoming a widespread disease in all age groups. One must not overlook the fact that one Austrian child in 10 now has asthma. The rate of allergies is rising in a striking manner, and the rate of asthma among adults has doubled over the last 12 years. We have to act using gentle methods that have been confirmed by scientific medical evidence. The result of this research project is clear. Spending time at the waterfall led to a lasting improvement in the respiratory tract and had a positive effect on lung function. It is remarkable that the reduction of all asthma symptoms among the children at the waterfall lasted for four months. Ultrafine electrically charged water particles were transported through the respiratory tract to the lungs by the microfine mist, 
causing lasting, functional, symptomatic and immunological improvement. One can demonstrate that homeopathy works in the same manner. Up to now, we've taken a series of images in an unsystematic manner, and they reveal that potentialization, shaking and diluting, changes the images. We've done our own experiments with shaking. In this case, we used ultrasound to agitate the water, and we could see that the drops changed. And we could also see that plants grow more rapidly when they are watered with this kind of water. And from that point of view, there can be no doubt in my mind that there is an effect. Because if the image of the drop changes, there has been a change in the informational content. And if the informational content is changed and communicates with the body water from outside or by mixing, then it is also clear that the control function of the body can be different too. Professor Kröplin's team assigns a high priority to their droplet analysis. A simple visit to the dentist can become a spectacular experiment. And it was one of my colleagues, he went to the dentist, and he had to have an x-ray, and so he thought, I want to have a look at the effect the x-ray has on me. So he took a drop of his saliva and put it in a little tube and left it outside while he was having his x-ray taken. And after the x-ray, he again took some saliva and put it in another tube. And when he got back to the institute, he took some more saliva and put it in a third tube. And then he took the three different saliva samples and looked at them under a dark field microscope. And he could see the way his saliva looked before he had the x-ray at the dentist's. A short time later, and the way his saliva looked when he was back at the institute, and it had recovered somewhat. We thought that to be a highly interesting experiment. Water plays a decisive role in everyday life in the preparation of food. Bakers, in particular, are aware of that. They consider Grander's water revitalization to be an insider's tip. When you consider that the rule of thumb is two parts flour, one part water, you realize how important water is. Master baker Josef Schnallinger from Pramet in Upper Austria secretly installed water revitalization equipment at his bakery. The bakers came to me and said, the sourdough runs over every day. There must be something wrong. What's going on? Every day we stir up the same ingredients with a dough machine, and every day the dough runs over. That's how I discovered the power of grander water. It's the only thing that could be doing that. News of the special effect of the water spread like wildfire among the baking community. Grander simply gave us the opportunity of taking a step forward. The dough has become more lively because of it. We use less yeast, but as a side effect, the dough takes up more water and simply makes the bread easier to digest. We get bread that has a smoother taste and stays fresh longer. For us, these are fundamentally important aspects. We no longer need additives like guar gum or swelling flour. Instead, we use high-quality flour and high-quality water, and with that combination we get results that others only get by using additives. The news has even reached Italy. Massimo Grazioli of Milan is a baker heart and soul, and he too tried the experiment. The bread certainly has a thinner crust, more refined taste, and is easier to digest because we use far less yeast, both natural and compressed yeast. It produces bread with a more tender crust and a more pronounced and regular texture. The taste is improved as well. Of course you can bake bread without grander water, but if you want higher quality and a real high quality product, it helps enormously. Experiments on water revitalization are being conducted in many different places in the world. Bangkok is home to the world's largest processor of exotic fruit. 
A special experiment was conducted at a cannery 300 kilometers south of the Thai capital. An Austrian invention, water revitalization, was installed in the company's water system where thousands of tons of tropical fruits are processed for export. There was a measurable improvement in water quality and chemicals were substantially reduced. The company's production director was surprised by the results, especially with regard to processing the aloe vera plant, which requires a lot of water. The most uh, important that we can see is our aloe vera product. That's the aloe vera product is uh, difficult to wash because of the slime in the aloe vera or aloe in, in the aloe vera. So when we use the candlelight water, we can see that the slime or aloe in of the aloe vera is easy to wash. The second is the, our equipment uh, or the machine. When we washing or the cleaning uh, every day, we can find that uh, the slime on the equipment or utensil is easy to wash. And we can use less effort than before. At the administration building, there is a public swimming pool. It was only logical. If water revitalization has a positive effect on production, why not at the swimming pool? Swimming pool operators are all faced with the same problems, the smell of chlorine and the growth of algae in the water. Before that, we need to uh, maintain the, the, the cleanness of the water. So to be able to make water become clear, you need to add up more chlorine. And because we are in a closed space, so the chlorine smell, it's very irritating for the people who stay in the club. The smell, it's become less because we, we were able to use less chlorine, so like we can reduce about 50%. So the smell becomes decreased. And one thing that I have to add, we are able to maintain the pool uh, easier. Before that, it always like um, have the green stuff. Every three weeks, we have to have a scuba tank to go into the, pe the pool to clean up the green, the green algae. It doesn't grow anymore. When we use the water in the industry, we have to solve the problem uh, or the burden of the using water with chemicals. And now we have an alternative uh, that the granulized water works better than the chemicals. As Eshel Ben Jakob warns, water is quite vulnerable. If this is the case, as I mentioned before, uh, we have to rethink the way that we treat our water. In any case, one has to be extremely careful in dealing with water. If water indeed has memory, the fact that we are so uncareful about the treatment of water can cause the water that we have to eventually to become non-suitable or stressful to organic systems. I don't want to sound as someone who brings a message now of a disaster, but it can happen. They will not be poisonous, they will not have uh, some minerals that are not uh, uh, in, within the regulations, but they will be undrinkable in the sense that drinking this water will cause us some damage or will weaken our system as a whole. And more important is that if we treat the water this way, the bacteria that we cannot live without might go through dramatic changes and will not be able to function in supporting the environment that we see around. The University of Technology in Graz not only studies mysterious water bridges, but also all other anomalies of water there is clear recognition that water research is still in its early days. 
but ultra-modern measuring equipment continues to deliver astonishing results. We measured water samples 20 times, always the same water with standardized methods, and 20 times we got different results. We got 20 curves that are different in this area here. We also measured propanol 20 times and the curves matched almost perfectly. For the layman, these are just a few curves. For the researchers, however, water remains an unpredictable element. There are so many anomalies, more than 40 anomalies that include almost all the physical parameters, boiling point, melting point, surface tension, viscosity, refraction index, velocity of sound in water, conductance. Anomalies, anomalies. I mean things that you really cannot explain with conventional models. We certainly don't have any explanatory model for water that is entirely adequate. I do not really believe that, once we finally understood it, that the entire worldview of the natural sciences will have changed, but I do think we're in for a surprise. Every research project raises more questions than it answers. Water will continue to be a topic of discussion for many generations of scientists to come. I really feel that I'm only at the beginning of water research. And I think all I have to do is wonder how our world will look in 20, 30 or 40 years, you know. Probably our world will have identified these transmission phenomena that we are just now discovering. Some of them will have been identified as phenomena of oscillation, some of them as phenomena of imaging. And when we then systematize them, together with our research into consciousness and medicine, the knowledge will be transferable to the control processes of the body and we will discover a preventive medicine capable of changing things at an early stage when there is anything wrong with the body. What we know is a drop. What we don't know is an ocean. Isaac Newton. Ah, uh, you have the characteristic of James Bond and you have zero zero in front of your name. Maybe you can tell if you shake or steer martini the difference. <laughs>